Hello. Uh, good afternoon. Well, good morning, but good afternoon to those who are joining us uh, on the East Coast. And welcome to this roundtable on Colorado's wildlife. Um, I'm excited for the opportunity to lead this virtual roundtable where we will explore my home state of Colorado as a case study of the incredible wildlife conservation happening in our country and to hear from the wonderful people on the ground who work to conserve our wildlife and make wildlife viewing possible, sustainable, and accessible to all Americans. <laughs> uh, you can hear my daughter in the background joining us for this wonderful roundtable as we all participate remotely for today's uh, roundtable. I want to thank Chairman Grijalva in particular for his leadership uh, for making the protection of our public lands and our wildlife a top priority of his tenure as the chairman of the House Natural Resources Committee and giving me the opportunity uh, to uh, host this roundtable today. I'll begin with some brief opening remarks and background, and then we'll turn over to our panel of wildlife and outdoor recreation experts for their wisdom on these topics, followed by Q&A from the members of Congress participating. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. While much of the conserva uh, conservation uh, that we'll be talking about today is local to Colorado, it's important that we understand the larger global and nationwide context. Last year, a groundbreaking analysis found that one million animal and plant species are threatened with extinction. Our actions have put wildlife in danger, and the report projected that these negative trends will ultimately continue through 2050 and beyond due to the impacts of increasing land use change, exploitation of organisms, including wildlife trafficking, and the climate crisis. In order to reverse or slow these concerning and dangerous trends, swift action is needed at every level of government. However, rather than tackling this problem uh, and, and taking it head on, the Trump administration has not only turned its back on wildlife, it has mounted a full-scale attack through reckless changes to the Endangered Species Act, the National Environment Policy Act, or NEPA, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, our marine national monuments and public lands, and more and more rollbacks, which seem to be announced almost daily. These attacks are unacceptable. Many state and local governments have decided to take their cue from science rather than ignorance and have made remarkable strides in conservation. And I'm so proud that Colorado and, and the Congressional District 2 are leaders in wildlife recovery and outdoor recreation. Today, we look to Colorado to inspire future federal action. I'd like to give a little background on Colorado's rich and diverse wildlife. People from all over the country and indeed the world travel here to visit our gorgeous state. I know they visit uh, the gorgeous state of uh, our wonderful chairman as well, Arizona, but uh, they come to Colorado in hopes of catching a glimpse of our nation's most iconic species. Some species, however, are in danger. There are 159 animal species considered species of greatest conservation need in Colorado, as well as 117 plant species. Some examples are the golden eagle, sage grouse, the lynx, the white-tailed prairie dog. These are the highest overarching priorities for these species conservation are more research and more monitoring, and most importantly, habitat management and restoration. Our state is an excellent model of ongoing wildlife conservation in the U.S. with many success stories we can point to. Colorado brought the black-footed ferret back from the very brink of extinction. In fact, it was believed to be extinct twice, and now we have a population of about 600 and are reintroducing them back into the wild. And of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the recovery of the gray wolf, which had been absent from our state for decades until just recently when we've had several wolf spottings in Northwest Colorado up in Jackson County. This November, Coloradans will see a ballot initiative for the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission to make a plan to reintroduce the gray wolf in specially designated areas just a few short years from now and, and the voters of Colorado will ultimately make the final determination. Colorado is home to eight national wildlife refugees, uh, excuse me, refugees, as well as 350 state wildlife areas. Wildlife viewing has an enormous economic impact in our state. In fact, in 2016, wildlife related visits to Colorado supported 4,600 jobs, $202 million in salaries and wages, uh, $631 million in sales, $34 million in state and local tax revenue, and $49 million in federal tax revenue. Uh, there, this is evidence uh, that, uh, you know, in my view, uh, the the benefits of, of wildlife viewing are, are also economic ones to our state and conserving and restoring wildlife is not just important for posterity, of course, but also for our economy. However, I want to properly acknowledge that access to the outdoors is not easy or feasible for all. For example, while people of color make up 38% of the U.S. population, they only constituted 22% of national park visitors in 2014. People of color have been excluded historically from outdoor spaces. As, as you all know, segregation of national parks continued uh, through the better part of the 1940s. And even in 2014, about 80% of National Park Service employees uh, were not people of color. As America confronts 
pervasive uh, systemic racism, we need to examine all of our institutions and ensure uh, that uh, all people uh, in, in our country have equal access and opportunity to wildlife and, and the outdoors, given the joy that, that they bring to so many people. Many of our panelists will tell you about these access issues and what they're doing to make lasting positive change for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Wildlife management is complicated. It is a complex topic. And just like any ecosystem, it is uh, you know, composed of many different moving parts from the wildlife itself to the scientists, the activists, policymakers, and everyday folks who come together to, to see the wonders that nature has to offer. Colorado is a thriving example of, of uh, a healthy and resilient outdoor economy. And I'm thrilled for my state, Colorful Colorado, to take the spotlight today and, and have a productive panel discussion on how we will continue to move forward. Now, without further ado, I'll uh, go ahead and introduce our panelists. First, I'd like to introduce the first gentleman of Colorado and my good friend and constituent, uh, Mr. Marlon Reese, an outstanding advocate for animal welfare issues here in our state. He is nationally known for his advocacy, a vocal and stalwart defender of all critters, big and small. It's such an honor to have him to join us today. I have been so uh, grateful to see his leadership uh, over the course of many years, but in particular over the course of the last two years as the first gentleman of Colorado, testifying at the state legislature time after time in support of defending animals and, and wildlife here in our state. Thank you so much, first gentleman, for uh, joining us uh, at this uh, round table, and you may begin your opening statement. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Congressman Goose, for the invitation to address this round table today. Uh, I want to congratulate Congressman Goose for passing the CORE Act through the House, and I urge the Senate to pass it and send it to the President's desk. Thank you to Chairman Grijalva for the opportunity to be here. And thank you to my co-panelist, Taisha Adams from Colorado Parks and Wildlife, who is helping CPW live up to their slogan, Live Life Outdoors, and Loretta Pineda from Environmental Learning for Kids, helping so many youngsters develop lifelong learning and love for the outdoors. It's an absolute honor to be here with you today to discuss this important topic. You all have my written testimony, so I want to spend the balance of my time talking about what Colorado has done and recommendations for the federal government. As a broad statement, public lands are incredibly important, especially during this pandemic when it's harder to be with each other indoors, and we need to do a better job protecting these lands, protecting wildlife, and making sure we expand outdoor recreation opportunities to everyone. I'm proud of the steps that Colorado has taken in this regard. Our state parks are admission free on Colorado Day coming up on August 1st, and Colorado Parks and Wildlife currently has the bandwidth to offer up to four free days per year. Our veterans have free access to state parks all through the month of August, and one of our most renowned state initiatives is GOCO, Great Outdoors Colorado, which invests heavily in public lands and local open space, providing many free opportunities for outdoor recreation and wildlife viewing including teacher training, field trips to give kids opportunities for hands-on learning, and a public campaign called Generation Wild. In many of our school districts, environmental education is part of the core curriculum. In addition, Colorado Parks and Wildlife also operates youth wildlife education camps, including the Adventure Backpacks program, a partnership with local libraries whereby children can check out a backpack with binoculars, educational materials, and a pass for free access to state parks. Finally, I wanna highlight that our state has done incredible work establishing wildlife crossings, which preserve migratory patterns and habitats for our precious wildlife, while saving the lives of motorists and passengers that use our roads every day. We've done some great work at the state level and the federal government has been an important partner in this work. If we wanna ensure equitable access for all while caring for and expanding our public lands in a way that protects the delicate balance of nature, then diversifying funding for our public lands is tremendously important. We cannot continue to charge exorbitant fees that put these places out of reach for families struggling financially. I ask the committee to prioritize funding to protect our public lands and, and wildlife, not just for today, not only for us, but for future generations. One of the best federal opportunities to invest in conservation is through the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Among my favorite examples of the fund's uh, power for equitable access is the Rocky Mountain Arsenal National Wildlife Refuge, a former weapons storage facility used during the Cold War, which was converted to a wildlife refuge through LWCF. 
The refuge is now a go-to recreation and environmental education site for families, local schools, and organizations serving primarily low to middle income and diverse constituencies. Congress should also consider supporting and growing transit to trails programs to help folks without vehicles to access the great outdoors and consider including transit information on federal websites for our national parks, forest wildlife refuges, as well as booking and planning tools like recreation.gov. In Colorado, we're working to do just that and have partnered with Zipcar to provide park act passes to those who don't own a car. Congress should prioritize conservation and wildlife funding during the appropriations process and be sure to include our public lands in any additional COVID-related funding proposals, uh, such as Congressman Neguse has proposed in H.R. 7264, a 21st Century Conservation Corps. Congress can also help by prioritizing wildlife crossing infrastructure and ongo in ongoing surface transportation legislation discussions and advancing legislation like H.R. 2795, the Wildlife Corridors Conservation Act by Representative Beyer. And we need to ensure that when we're talking about wildlife conservation, we're not just talking about hunting and angling. Last year, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services released a report showing that over 1 million species are at risk of extinction. In Colorado alone, as Congressman Neguse pointed out, we have uh, many dozens of species listed under the Federal Endangered Species Act. Evidence is clear that now is the time for bold action to safeguard our planet against human drivers of biodiversity loss, including deforestation, non-regenerative agri agriculture practices, uh, climate change, and overfishing. We must take a hard look at how we are spending taxpayer dollars and we should prioritize what truly matters. In these unprecedented times, funding for conservation should take precedence over funding for programs that employ outdated and overly heavy-handed approaches to wildlife management, programs like the federally funded wildlife services. There are so many important opportunities to ensure that people of all income levels from communities across our state are able to access our beautiful public lands and view our majestic wildlife. I'm thankful for the invitation to share some of Colorado's best practices, and I'm looking forward to today's robust discussion on how we can further improve access to the outdoors and across our beautiful country. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Mr. Reese, for your testimony, for sharing your experience. Our next panelist is uh, Ms. Taisha Adams, a member of the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission. She's also a senior technical consultant at the American Institutes for Research and the Colorado Co-Led for Outdoor Afro. She uh, is, uh, has been a relentless uh, advocate uh, for equity with respect to uh, our uh, parks and wildlife and outdoor places. And uh, we are so grateful for, for joining us today. Ms. Adams, uh, you may begin your statement. Wonderful. Thank you so much and good afternoon, uh, Representative Nagus, uh, Chair Guajalva, and other distinguished members of the Committee on Natural Resources. My name is Taisha Adams and I'm a commissioner with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Uh, I am a passionate servant leader dedicated to intersectional environmental justice, justice that requires cooperation of people and planet. With over 25 years sitting at the intersection of education, health, workforce, and the environment, I'm collaborating with stakeholders throughout Colorado, our nation, and the world. And today, I have the privilege of speaking with you all about the need to increase not only access, but also to increase diverse representation, meaningful participation, and quality experiences so, so that everyone can share in the benefits, economically and otherwise. I commend Chair Guajalva and Representative McEachin on their landmark Environmental Justice for All bill and the Congressional Convening on Environmental Justice at the Capitol last year as well as Representative Neguse for his work on the Congressional Climate Report, which was inspired by the people living in Colorado to address the threat of climate change. I too support the notion that all people have the right to pure air, clean water, and an environment that encourages and nourishes and enriches our lives. But with this great opportunity comes great responsibility. And in 2019, I was appointed by Governor Polis to serve on the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Committee, the first, or commission, the first African-American woman in the commission's history. 
And our commission sets regulations and policies for Colorado's 55 now state parks and wildlife management um, responsibilities. And so imagine my excitement as I join this commission and I hear this crazy French ranch come in. What is this about? Well, the Nature Conservancy had acquired this property that includes Fisher's Peak in partnership with the city of Trinidad, uh, the Colorado Parks and Wildlife, course, and the Trust for Public Land and Great Outdoors Colorado. And the, the property is rich in biodiversity, recreational potential, and has become Colorado's first state park acquisition in over a quarter century. But the key to that success was meaningful participation by a large group of committed people that had deep roots with each other that was grown over many years. Transformation requires deep roots. And I wonder how these time considerations are addressed in policy and grant making. And though most of my experiences serving in this position have exceeded my expectations, I would be remiss if I did not mention the challenges of being the only non-white voice in the room most times. The lack of Black, Indigenous, Asian Pacific Islander, and Latino, Latinx, Latina voices, BIPOC voices in these rooms beyond public comment, beyond focus groups, beyond interviews, but real meaningful decision-making opportunities is deafening, especially when one considers that Black, Indigenous, Asian Pacific Islanders, and Latinos, Latinas, Latina peoples are most impacted negatively by the changes in our climate. We must be involved when the most important decisions about life on Earth are being made. And now I'm in these rooms. And I'm grateful to have the opportunity with my fellow commissioners, staff, partners, residents, and visitors of Colorado. And I'm, I'm grateful also to cross paths with people like Rue Mapp, founder of Outdoor Afro, where Black people connect and lead in nature. And Dr. Carolyn Finney, author of Black Faces, White Spaces, reimagining the relationship of African Americans to the great outdoors. Or Dr. Josetta Taylor, whose report in 2014 titled The State of Diversity in Environmental Organizations, Mainstream Non-Governmental Organizations and Foundations, which surveyed almost 200 environmental nonprofit organizations, 74 agencies, and 28 found, uh, foundations, investigating issues around gender and race. And the report found that although there has been an increase in racial diversity, that racial diversity is not reflected in the compositions of these organizations and agencies. There is, in fact, a green ceiling that remains. And to address these gaps, the report recommended transparency, accountability, and resources. It's time to close these gaps and cracks in our systems as we reimagine what collective responsibility and impact can look like. And so as I sit with uh, the Colorado Department of Natural Resources led by uh, Director Dan Gibbs, I was excited to know that we have goals around diversity, equity, inclusion, um, ensuring that we are that those voices are heard. And as this committee considers where to go from here, I wonder how we can learn from the lessons of our past, the lessons of Brown versus the Board of Education that ruled that racial segregation was unconstitutional in our public schools. What our history books failed to tell us, failed to mention, was the sub substantive number of Black principals and teachers who were fired or demoted in the name of access without representation. To this day, the educator workforce remains overwhelmingly white. 82% of educators are white, and that is not reflective of the communities being that served. So without this representation, meaningful participation and quality, I fear that we will have the same fate as our public education system. And I urge this committee to strengthen authentic BIPOC-led and community informed grant making and programs so that they are robust and maybe even have meaningful set asides to ensure that to recenter marginalized communities so that we can have BIPOC researchers, scientists, policymakers, community members, and intersectional environmentalists who can reimagine so that we can meet these unique and large challenges ahead of us together. I look forward to continued conversations and opportunities for collective actions today, tomorrow, and every day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, our final panelist is Ms. Loretta Panetta, the Executive Director of Environmental Learning for Kids, which 
advocates for access to the outdoors for communities of color and low-income communities. Ms. Panetta, now you may begin your opening statement. Thank you, uh, Congressman Ngozi and uh, Chairman Griff Halva and members of the House Committee of Natural Resources. I thank you for this opportunity to participate in this virtual forum today. I'm Loretta Pineda, Executive Director of Environmental Learning for Kids, ELK. I'm a Colorado native and currently live in Denver. ELK is a Denver-based inclusive nonprofit organization that develops inspired, responsible leaders through science education and outdoor experiences for under-resourced youth. Um, ELK serves 5,000 low-income youth, ages 5 to 25, their families in Denver, Adams, and Arapahoe counties. 82% of ELK students self-report that they are eligible for free or reduced lunch, and a majority of our youth are students of color. ELK focuses on outdoor experiential field activities and learning experiences, such as overnight camping, hiking, snowshoeing, fishing, uh, trips to many of Colorado state parks, national parks, and open spaces. We provide an in-depth study of the environment, ecosystems, conservation, team building, and of course, fun. On most trips, we are in the right place at the right time, which means we viewed bison and bald eagles at the Rocky Mountain Arsenal National Wildlife Refuge, seen elk bugle in Rocky Mountain National Park, photographed moose at the CSU Mountain Campus, gone birding at Aurora Reservoir, and we've met bighorn sheep near Echo Lake. This is just a few of our encounters. All young people deserve strong educational support, good role models, and opportunities for positive action to become engaged, productive, and caretakers of their natural world. Specific and entrenched barriers ranging from social, racial, economic, and educational inequities affect not only our students, but their families, their communities, and ultimately generations. The need for greater access to natural areas for outdoor opportunities like wildlife viewing has never been greater. Elk is not alone in the efforts to bring the appreciation of the outdoors to young people and families and communities of color. There are numerous partners and agencies we collaborate with, including the Next 100 Coalition and the Great Outdoors Colorado Northeast Metro Coalition, dedicated partners in the space to protect our public lands and bring equity to outdoor recreation. A recent report by the Outdoor Foundation concluded that nearly half of the U.S. population did not participate in outdoor recreation in 2018. Colorado averages 300 sunny days each year and is famous for its natural splendor and outdoor sporting heritage. However, the reality is that out access to outdoor adventures remains extremely challenging to many families living, living in historically underserved communities. Colorado's outdoor recreation economy generates $37 billion in consumer spending annually and contributes 511,000 direct jobs. Those who work in the industry have earned over $21 billion in wages and salaries, while those who support it have generated $9 billion in state and local tax revenue. Despite the enormous economic, physical, mental, and environmental benefits that the outdoor provides, stark disparities have left many low-income communities and communities of color without access to quality recreation opportunities. Young people have developed the impression that nature is something out there. One student described to me, I can see the Rocky Mountains from my front door, but getting out there is not a reality. What can we do to ensure that we can all get out there to, and be at the right place at the right time? First, it's important to make sure that outdoor spaces are welcoming for our kids and all people which involves addressing racism and mistreatment of people of color in the outdoors by other outdoor recreators and sometimes even land management staff. Provide culturally relevant environmental natural resources and outdoor education opportunities. It's also important to tell the stories of leaders of color who have been paving the way of the outdoors for a long time, but whose stories are never heard. Um, also support uh, community initiatives. Currently, the Colorado Next 100 Coalition is conducting a landscape assessment uh, this year to better understand barriers <clears throat> across the state, get ideas from communities on how to address these barriers, and understand who else is working in this space. This effort will lead us to develop an outdoor equity initiative, which will inform future policy and funding needs. And finally, 
increase staff diversity at land management agencies within the outdoor recreation industry, actively seat, recruit, and develop and train uh, people, uh, black, indigenous, and people of color. Our motto is, you can't be it if you can't see it. We must break down the racial biases toward hiring that are institutionalized in our workplaces. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this forum. I look forward to working with you for our youth and for our natural world. Thank you, uh, Ms. Panetta, and, and thank you to all the panelists for joining us uh, today and, and educating us today in the midst of a very chaotic time. Certainly very much appreciated. We'll now move on to the uh, Q&A portion of the discussion. Uh, I'll start us off and then we'll rotate between Democratic and Republican members. Uh, I know there are a number of uh, competing committee meetings and hearings uh, today, this morning. So uh, folks will uh, hopefully be able to, to join us uh, uh, as they attend these other hearings as well. Uh, I'll go ahead and start with uh, Mr. Reese. In regards to wildlife conservation and wildlife viewing, I guess I wonder if you could expound, I mean, you talked about this during your opening statement, but what you think Colorado is doing right that the federal government could try to emulate. You mentioned wildlife corridors, um, which of course has been you know, wildly successful in Colorado and, and in my district and, and uh, Representative Byers' bill you know, seeks to, to emulate Colorado's approach in that respect. And I'm certainly a, a proud uh, co-sponsor of that bill, but I wonder if you might be able to, to add uh, some further insights. Congressman Nagus, uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to highlight uh, a few examples, I think, in Colorado that uh, can definitely be uh, implemented on some level at, at the federal level. Uh, really, uh, to start, uh, instill an appreciation for nature at a young age. Uh, we have a wonderful program in Colorado called Generation Wild, uh, which uh, does just that. Uh, further develop and expanding wildlife crossings and corridors, as you mentioned, uh, is a big step, something that uh, is going to be uh, up to 90% effective uh, wherever it's done around the country. Uh, we've been able to uh, save a lot of money, save a lot of lives, uh, and in fact, a study in ecology and society uh, found that the average cost to auto insurance of colliding uh, with an elk is $17,483. Um, wildlife management agencies really need uh, more diverse funding structures. Uh, to that end, uh, economic analysis shows that money going into our national parks provides a 10 to 1 return on investment per dollar invested. Uh, that figure on the state level uh, speaking generally for public lands is four to one, also significant. Uh, and we need to fight against uh, a uh, head in the sand approach uh, to policy making. We need to invest in wildlife and habitat mapping. Uh, we need more federal money to conduct population studies of animals. Uh, agencies can effectively manage our natural resources when we don't know, for example, where wildlife are migrating. Uh, our agencies also can't effectively set bag limits for hunting and angling uh, when we don't know how many of each animal is out there. That's not to say that we aren't uh, doing a good job studying those numbers at the state level, but uh, we could definitely prioritize that at the federal. Uh, and then the National Environmental uh, Policy Act that you mentioned, Congressman, in uh, your opening is an example. Uh, at the federal level of what needs to be happening uh, at the state level, uh, but it's being gutted by the current administration. Uh, in many of these areas, the current administration is stripping funding, so our state level agencies are left with fewer resources to study the environment and quite literally what is in it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Reese. The next question I had uh, was for Ms. Pinetta, um, and I would just note that to, your, to the point that you made, uh, Mr. Reese, I think is a very valid one. And as we have conversations about funding priorities in Washington, particularly as we talk about uh, you know, potential <clears throat> stimulus bills and ways in which we can stimulate the economy, I, my sense is that uh, you know, ensuring that we have more diverse revenue streams uh, for some of these programs at the state level um, is 
uh, should be part of that conversation and something that I'm certainly going to continue to advocate for. Uh, Ms. Panetta, you know, I mentioned in my opening statement how uh, African Americans and other people of color make up a disproportionately small number of national park visitors per year. And I, I guess I wonder if you could explain some of the factors that contribute, contribute to that problem. You already, you know, during your opening statement, I think articulated uh, some of the financial considerations, for example, the, the obstacles um, that are in place. But I just wonder if you might be able to add uh, a bit more detail. In your own experience in Colorado, how do we make these beautiful public spaces easily accessible so that everybody has the ability to connect and explore and appreciate nature? And just by way of background, we my congressional district, of course, includes some of the most iconic national parks and uh, national forests in the United States, including Rocky Mountain National Park uh, in Estes Park. And so I think uh, for me, it's very personal of wanting to make sure that we do everything we can to, to broaden the doors, so to speak, for, the, for that park and for others um, to, to people of color in our state and, and elsewhere. Uh, thank you, Congressman Nagus. Yes, uh, Rocky Mountain National Park is one of our favorites and, uh, you know, for our students and our families in particular. And, um, you know, some of the barriers are in terms of transportation, um, you know, having family time, um, gear, uh, you know, having the right gear. Um, also, you know, a lot of the media around who is in the outdoors. Um, sometimes when you see, you see really, you know, like fit people, mostly white people, um, you know, they're jumping over mountains and <laughs> doing all of these extraordinary things when really it's just kind of getting in the, in the outdoors, going on an easy hike. I mean, there's a lot of different things you can do in the outdoors. Um, you know, our students love to play cards when they get outside, you know, they spend time around the campfire making s'mores or that kind of thing. So, I mean, there's a lot of different activities that aren't necessarily shown in our media and they're not seeing themselves in media. Um, so a lot of it is, is around, um, you know, just that kind of access and representation. Um, our families also love to go and on our camping trips, you know, we'll bring everything. We'll bring tents campfires, all the food. And so, you know, one mom said to me, she goes, I love this. I don't have to cook, you know? And so it's just a lot of those things when, you know what it's like when you go camping, you've got to, you know, you bring the whole household. And so for our families to be able to, you know, a lot of them are working two jobs and just don't have the time, but when they come with us, they can really relax and they actually spend time with their kids. So, you know, for our family trips, those are the things that, that are most, um, you know, most iconic and we have, uh, you know, some of our students that we've taken on spring break trips. Uh, we do a big spring break, break trip um, in, uh, you know, during their spring break, calling it an alternative spring break. And unfortunately this year we couldn't go, but uh, we've gone to the Grand Canyon and we have students that are just, they can't get enough. Every time they see it, it looks different. And the one thing they say to me is that, you know, it is great for them, but they think of everyone else at home and their families that will never have a chance to to do some of these trips. So that's why we have included families in a lot of our programming and, uh, you know, as much community as possible. But I think, like I said, if you can't, you know, if you don't see it, you you can't you don't think you can be it. So um, so th that's one of the things we try to instill in our families and in our programming. Thank you, uh, Ms. Panetta, and uh, I think that it's that's so true, particularly that last, uh, uh, the, the last uh, kind of moniker that you mentioned. Uh, if you don't see it, you know, it's hard to hard to be it. And so uh, in any event, very, very informative and helpful for us as policymakers as we kind of think about how to carefully craft some policies that would you know, create an ecosystem in which people of color feel welcome in the outdoors. So with that, I will uh, now recognize our distinguished chairman, uh, Mr. Cajalva, for uh, five minutes. Of Thank you very much, Mr. Nagus. Uh, yeah. I um, want to thank you for, for the round table uh, and a, a story for the people of Colorado. You know, usually uh, I have to go around begging people to come on the Natural Resources Committee. Uh, and uh, Mr. Nagus kept pestering me. I said, of course, you're going to be on the committee. You're the only one who's asked. Uh, <laughs> but I, and I mean that facetiously, but it's true. You know, the Resources Committee for many years has been considered less a less lower tier committee. Well, uh, the importance of it uh, is, is, is obvious now. 
given everything we're dealing with with the Trump administration. Our, our work has been this this Ted during this administration is to keep the worst from happening. And uh, but I think that everything we're talking about today and, and, and Colorado is a good example. What are the best practices? What what are the experiences at a state level and a local level that can translate into the kind of federal policies? Because right now we don't have a multi use concept at a federal level. We have a one use concept with just essentially extraction. And after that, uh, uh, nothing else. And, you know, in the twilight of this administration and within 24 hours, the Endangered Species Act gets changed, NEPA gets changed, uh, um, uh, Marine uh, National Monuments get changed, Clean Water Act gets changed, uh, et cetera. And, and that's been the onslaught from now on. But I, I, I mentioned uh, my friend, Mr. Naboose, coming out to the committee and, and the committee, the complexion of the committee, I don't think people understand. Uh, only almost half of the committee is of color, African-American, Native American, and Latino. And so the emphasis has shifted. I remember when I asked to be many years ago to be in the committee, I remember one of the, one of the uh, members who was uh, in leadership, uh, Rahm Emanuel, used to be mayor of Chicago, Asked me, you don't want to be on that committee. You should be somewhere where you deal with healthcare and education, because this committee is about the environment. And uh, and I think that whole attitude has changed significantly since then. And when when you have the leadership of Mr. Nagus on on this committee, uh, as uh, coming on to this Congress, that has been good. And we've passed great legislation, Core Act, Mr. Getz legislation, and the list goes on. And uh, Senate, it goes into the abyss of the Senate, but nevertheless, that template has been set for the future. I, 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 I want to tell another story, and, and it goes to some of the point that uh, uh, I think it's Adam is made. My dad was in his middle 70s, and he lived in Arizona almost all his life since he came here when he was 13 or 14, and worked here all his life. And a couple of years before he passed, what he wanted to see was the Grand Canyon. He'd never been there in the state, one of the crown jewels. And we took him. And the whole family went, as, as Ms. Pineda said. And it was an outing. And, uh, you know, I think that to me what gave me a very strong impression about and, and, and really moved me in the sense that, you know, the accessibility issue of our public lands and waters uh, to all to all Americans is, is critical, and and it continues to be critical to this committee. One of the things I was going to ask, uh, let me, Mr. Reese, you stated that your goals was as uh, are to advance animal welfare, public health, equity. Uh, how do you see all these issues intersecting? It, it goes to the the discussion that we've been having generally. When we talk about uh, diversity and accessibility to the outdoors, what? Um, how do you break down some of the barriers that we've also been talking about? Today? Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity, uh, Chairman Grijalva. Uh, it's wonderful to see you. Uh, I think uh, in answer to your question, the most important recognition uh, is that we do not exist outside nature, but we exist within it. Uh, we see examples of this everywhere we look nowadays, uh, but perhaps most prominently uh, in the case of uh, zoonotic diseases, diseases that uh, pass from uh, animals to people uh, like COVID-19. Uh, we're reminded of that link between uh, ourselves, uh, even though we live in town, cities, uh, urban areas, and uh, the natural world. Uh, COVID-19, uh, as we're uh, learning day by day, uh, more, like, more than likely started in a wildlife market as a result of the way uh, we interact with the environment. And it's a pandemic uh, that yet again and again we see does not discriminate uh, and it's uh, low income and minority communities uh, worst of all. Uh, and there are multiple reasons uh, for that. I'm as a non healthcare professional. Uh, my understanding, though, is that uh, it comes down to comorbidities like high blood pressure, reduced access to healthcare services. Uh, and they're making this pandemic especially hard on 
on low-income families. Uh, even uh, as uh, Commissioner Adams mentioned, uh, access to things like clean drinking water. Um, and then there is, uh, we have the physical barriers, and uh, as uh, Ms. Pineda and Commissioner Adams mentioned, we also have uh, the um, non-physical barriers. So what does it mean to be outdoorsy? Uh, in Colorado, uh, you know, I've, I've had so many conversations in the past year and a half as first gentleman uh, that started with, but I'm not a hunter or I don't fish. Uh, at the government level, we need to do a lot more to promote the many, many ways uh, that people can and do enjoy nature. Uh, hunting and fishing are two very important forms of outdoor recreation. Uh, they're the uh, forms that I think are uh, most traditionally well known, uh, but there's literally a whole world out there. Uh, collectively, anything that is not hunting and angling is termed uh, non-consumptive, uh, uses of our open spaces, but it includes things like wildlife watching, uh, hiking and camping, uh, as Ms. Pineda uh, pointed out, uh, photography, scientific studies, uh, inspiration for the arts, uh, you know, growing our imagination. Uh, and, you know, many of us need access to the outdoors, both for our physical and mental health. Uh, during this long period of, of social distancing that COVID-19 necessitates. Thank you. I yield back, Ms. Uh, Mr. Nagus. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, seeing as how I know we just heard uh, from uh, both Ms. Velasquez and Ms. Get, they both are in uh, competing markups uh, as, uh, as we would have it. We have a number of different committees that are holding markups. And simultaneously uh, in the busy month of July. So given that, I know they'll uh, perhaps both submit uh, questions and statements for the record, uh, but if the chairman will indulge, we'll uh, maybe perhaps do a second round of questioning. Um, and uh, I will uh, uh, start that off at, perhaps with Commissioner Adams. And Commissioner, I, I want to talk a little bit about just your experience, of course, serving um, on the uh, on the commission. Y you are, of course, very familiar with the Colorado State Wildlife Action Plan. And as you know, it cites habitat loss as a major threat to many of our species of greatest conservation need. What types of habitat are most at risk in Colorado and what is causing that decline? And I guess also, you know, to the extent that um, you, you, you know, would be willing to kind of advise how we move forward to protect habitat at the federal level in light of the unique challenges that uh, Colorado is facing. Thank you. Very happy to talk about that. Um, as you mentioned, uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife does have a um, state wildlife action plan um, that was developed and you know, really is guiding a lot of our work based on best practices and uh, what the research says. And unfortunately, you know, the, the, the types of habitat that have been that, that we're losing um, you know, are, are those rich, you know, diverse vegetative classifications, those terrestrial ecosystems, um, you know, those, the, the grasses and the, the water and, you know, all of those, those things that we can see and feel and smell. Um, and so when, when we're out, when we're outdoors. Um, and so, you know, when I think about, and when I looked into this report and talked to the staff at, at CPW or Colorado Parks and Wildlife, a couple of things, you know, we're we're losing our forests, we're losing our grasslands, we're losing our shrublands, we're using the wetlands, um, and what are we losing it to, right? So, um, and that's again, this intersectional environmentalism comes into play because the the greatest threat uh, to habitat is actually residential and commercial development. We have seen in Colorado a huge influx of new residents and increased visitorship, which is wonderful and has increased our economy greatly, which is also wonderful. However, um, the shadow side is that there's been increased impact to all of these different habitats. Um, and so the question becomes, um, you know, how are these decisions around residential and commercial development being made? Um, how, what weights or considerations are made when we're doing the environmental um, analyses as it relates to informing those decisions? 
are there metrics or um, you know actual um, caps or barriers or, or regulations that we can set as it relates to um, helping community local communities make that tough choice between economic sustainability uh, in the short term or strong environmental ecosystems in the long term, right? So right now we have we're in this place where we have to weigh short versus long term. And sadly, short term tends to win. And so what we're seeing now is these increase increases of wildfires. These increases, you know, I was I would live here in Boulder County when the great flood came and wiped out whole communities. Um, and a lot of that was based on overdevelopment. Um, so that's one piece. But also there's this need for increased research and evaluation around uh, to um, uh, Marlon Reese's comments about um, the need to increase people's understanding of habitat. And so that goes back to the intersectional approaches that need to happen where we're not separating education, health, and workforce. Each of these um, sectors are at play and we're not talking to each other. So what can the federal government do? Continue to create opportunities, convenings that break down these silos, that require us to have um, authentic and meaningful ongoing partnerships. So when a grant program comes, it's not isolated to environmental organizations, but it requires connections with local public schools. It requires connections to development programs and workforce programs. So that we're as a community working in tandem, we understand both the collective issues that are happening as well as the acute issues that are happening in our particular um, sectors, so that we can have that collective impact that's necessary. Thank you, uh, and and certainly your your point is a very valid one with respect to the grant programs, and that was a consideration that we you know explored. I mean, ultimately took the approach that you're describing. I mean, our 21st century uh, civil conservation core bill we just recently announced. So in any event, I would be remiss with the remaining seconds I have um, in my questioning to not also recognize uh, Governor Polis, which I should have done at the very outset of the hearing, um, uh, given uh, his uh, uh, outsized role uh, in Colorado in terms of, of protecting our wildlife and, and our public lands. And he's done an incredible job, in my view, of course, I'm biased, but uh, I certainly believe that he's done a really great job of moving the ball forward. Uh, on both fronts. So we, we thank him for his leadership. Um, with that, uh, Chairman Grahalva, uh, I will uh, yield to you for five minutes of question. Thank you, Mr. Nicholas. Uh, Ms. Pena, I'm just curious, you, you, your, your work with uh, young folks and, uh, you know, fostering not only an interest, but, uh, you know, hopefully creating that the base and the pipeline for future scientists and uh, and people that would uh, would be the stewards of the future of our public lands and waters. And can you, is there a story you can point to where you feel your program is kind of, of a student that's kind of pushed them into that career, to that field and, uh, and broadened the opportunities? Because I think as we work to diversify uh, although not much was done these last three and a half years, work to diversify the staffing uh, in in, in uh, interior. Uh, it, it's having that pipeline of people coming in that I think is going to be critical. And what you're doing with young people and uh, Mr. Nagusas and Mr. Byers' pieces of legislation are essential to that. But uh, if you don't mind, there's a story you can tell. Sure. Um, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you, Chairman Givalda. Um, yeah, I have a lot of stories <laughs> to tell, but um, there is a young woman who um, she actually uh, went through elk for several years and um, was in probably one of the first kind of core elk, um, you know, groups when elk started. Um, Elk's been around for 26 years. So, you know, our kids are having kids, <clears throat> basically. Uh, but uh, she uh, went on to get her degree and uh, took a long time for her. Uh, it's not always a straight path for a lot of our, our students, but she did get her degree in horticulture and she actually works, you know, really on the ground with uh, Denver Parks and Rec. 
And so, you know, she took what she learned at Elk and she really loved being in the out of doors. And, um, you know, we do a lot of community service projects. So we're out there pulling weeds and things that aren't very, you know, um, exciting, but, you know, they learn a lot. And so, and now um, she's on my board. Um, she's on my board of directors. Um, so, you know, that's the path. That's the path that I want our students to take. I want them to really become, you know, leaders in their community. Uh, we have another uh, student who now works at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Um, he's an educator. Um, it seems like in Elk, a lot of our students, they want to be educators. Um, I have nurses. Um, it's, I don't know, something about Elk uh, draws students to want to be really caretakers. And so I'm still trying to get in our students in to uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife. I'm working really hard at that. Uh, we've had some students that have interned at the National Park Service. Um, so, you know, it's, it's easy to kind of get those internships and I always insist that they be paid uh, because we just have to pay our young people. Otherwise they'll go and find, um, you know, jobs elsewhere. I mean, they need, they need to get paid for their work. So um, we also have an urban ranger program um, that we were able to hire uh, 10 students this summer, uh, even though they're doing a lot of their work virtually, um, but they uh, get an opportunity to, um, you know, visit different national parks, uh, state parks and uh, refuges. And my staff, um, I have a great staff and they work really hard to find people of color that are in those jobs in those places so that they can see themselves uh, doing this work. And Colorado Parks and Wildlife does a wonderful job of doing a career day where they bring a lot of different people uh, into the room. Um, you know, they bring accountants, they bring policy people, they bring, um, you know, the videographers, the photographers, the people that, you know, write the brochures or do the marketing so that our students can see, you know, you don't have to be outside and be a ranger. You can, whatever your passion is, you can find it in a career in the outdoors. Um, and that's particularly um, even uh, true of the outdoor recreation industry and all of the brands. Uh, we've, you know, we, um, you know, there's people that make clothes, you know, they design all of these, um, the outwear, you know, the out, outdoor wear. So there's a lot of different careers and ways and paths in which our students can, you know, participate, you know, in the outdoors and in these industries. They just have to kind of see it and be made aware of it. So, you know, our, there's a real passion of, in our students. And uh, once they see it, they, they get very, um, you know, passionate about their work. Uh, we work really hard to keep them in school. And uh, we've given out scholarships to a lot of our students. So we're working really hard to make sure, um, you know, they get a, a lot of these careers require like a science background. Um, what I'm working on right now is trying to see if programs like the one that ELK does and other programs, you know, through Conservation Legacy and other core programs, if there's any way for this experience to count towards school, you know, because it is rigorous, they do learn a lot. If they could get some college credit, it would just go a lot further in them getting that degree. So there's a lot of different ways in which, um, you know, we need to advance our students and advance our young people. Thank you. Mr. DeGoose, would you indulge me to ask Ms. Adams a question? Of course. I'm usually Thank restricted you. here into the five minute rule, as you know. <laughs> I know you're like a taskmaster when it comes to that. Uh, uh, Ms. Adams, uh, my question is about evasive species and, uh, you know, the, the problem of in, not only in our country, but globally. And, uh, and how that is the biggest one of the big threats to biodiversity uh, on a global level and also here in our country. I'm going to ask you how about invasive species in Colorado, what the commission and the uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife is doing to address that problem and uh, uh, any lessons for us to learn as as we go forward uh, tackling that on federal public lands and as well. Uh, the other thing is just to thank you uh, for uh, your uh, your support and uh, your input on the environmental justice for all piece of legislation. It was organic and 
people such as yourself have made it into a very, very, very good piece of legislation. I want to thank you for that as well. But invasive species being something we hear about all the time and seems that we kind of stumble around at a federal level at, at, at how to address it and any lessons learned from from Colorado, from yourself or a perspective that you might have. Absolutely. Happy to share, happy to share. You know, invasive species damages Colorado's land and waters. It hurts our economy. It ruins uh, recreational opportunity. It really threatens public health um, and, it, and it damages and, and impairs our infrastructure. And so, you know, our, our environment in Colorado, as indicated earlier, draws so many tourists, brings business, supports agriculture, and, 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 and to protect it, we, we are really hyper-focused, layers are focused on how do we manage in space invasive species quickly. And I think one of the biggest um, levers that we use uh, uh, around addressing um, the aquatic nuisance species and the noxious weeds um, and, and invasive animals is around a, a, a robust communication campaign to our anglers, our boaters, our gardeners, um, our outdoor recreationalists, um, as well as other professionals, letting them know the impact that we have that are that just humans as hikers or on watercrafts or hauling trailers and vehicles. Um, you know, again, the, the power that we have to um, both um, restrict the entry in of in this invasive species as well as to mitigate. We also know that with invasive species, the key to success is prevention on the front end. And so that's where that communication campaign comes into play. But recognizing that invasive species are invasive. And, and so we do have a, a robust plan as it relates to management when invasive species have been identified. And that's primarily through our aquatic nuisance uh, um, species program, which is a, a $1.6 million uh, that we spend um, on, on addressing these issues through um, both, you know, in, um, doing inspections. So, you know, we've done almost um, 100,000 inspections a year. Um, and then we do decontamination. We did 5,000 decontaminations um, last year as well. And, and all of that is quite costly. But again, it's that prevention on the front end and building those meaningful relationships between people and nature so that we can then um, not have to spend on the back end. But again, some of, to, to your question about what we can do to address it um, or what Colorado has done in addition to the campaigns is really recognizing that this is not a task for one agency. So, you know, these, these issues are you know the land that is is being impacted. Um, oftentimes, there the, it's an intersection. It, it crosses, as um, Mr. Reese mentioned earlier. You know our wildlife, these invasive species, knows no county line, knows no uh, district line, um, and sometimes is on federal property, state property, leased property, and so all of these players need to come in and and work together to address this. I'd say the most, again, and, and going back to the most significant issue for aquatic habitat are urbanization and the natural, the natural uh, systems classification. So that's dams and, and water management, both of which are huge issues in Colorado. So again, just pointing to, you know, hyper-focus on basic species requires intersectoral, multi-sector approaches. Um, and, and the other piece is, is, is regulatory. Who has the regulatory authority um, to make certain decisions, again, based on where these invasive species are being identified um, and uh, who has responsibility? So really working together with our conservation partners as well as um, other organizations and groups coming together. Is it the, role for, the role for the feds, Ms. Uh, Ms. Adams, is uh, in, in terms of supplemental resources, funding to to supplement uh the the efforts that are going on in colorado and to build that cross-jurisdictional collaboration that yes. i think is essential because the species doesn't know if it's on federal doesn't, land state no land. doesn't care yes a hundred percent and to be and to to set that model for what that looks and those expectations and making them into requirement, a required expectation around collaboration and cooperation. Across That's the regulatory part. 
The other piece is also those relationships so that it's not always just responding to what is negative, but how can we amplify what we know is working, what is strong? Um, and that's that community led, um, you know, community informed, community guided. So how do you break down those silos where, you know, our grandparents, our aunties who have knowledge about our lands are at those decision making tables? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nagus. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, very, very, very wanna, good table. No, thank you, uh, Mr. Kahalva. Thank you, of course, to each of the panelists for joining us today and for sharing your experiences and your recommendations. A big thank you to Chairman Grijalva, of course, for, for enabling us to host this important hearing and for his participation. And uh, again, I know uh, Ms. Deget and, and Ms. Velasquez uh, send their regrets and, and will uh, we'll submit their questions and statement for the written record. Um, also, thank you so much to those who tuned in to watch this forum. There's certainly so much to learn about conservation and promoting accessibility to the outdoors and wildlife viewing from really successful state efforts. And I hope we can all take lessons from Colorado with us into the future. So thanks again for joining us. Uh, please stay safe and stay healthy. And uh, with that, we will uh, uh, adjourn this roundtable.